so here we are. Uh, and my colleagues uh, assure me that in spite of uh, their heroic efforts, uh, and no doubt your um, a strenuous reading activities, uh, some people are still having difficulties understanding Frege and Russell. So I'm going to spend the first part of today's lecture going over that. I'm sorry to repeat myself, but maybe it doesn't hurt uh, from a pedagogical point of view. And uh, now, uh, my uh, strongest advice is reread the damn stuff. I mean, it took Russell and Frege a long time, literally years, to write this stuff, so you can spend more than a few minutes reading it. When you've re read it, read it again. Uh, the reading assignments in a course like this are not very long, uh, but they're not all easy. Uh, they tend to be tough. And nothing, I guess, is tougher than uh, Russell and Frege. So you should certainly reread uh, uh, the stuff assigned. And in particular, read that fun article called On Denoting. Read it a few times. Now, it's not easy. Because Russell wrote it, remember, in the, well, more than 100 years ago, and the use of the quantifier notation was not, uh, it didn't really exist at that time. I mean, maybe it existed in, in Peano's writings. Uh, but he, uh, when he puts this obscure thing, it is not always false of see that. And then he goes on and on. You remember that? Well, that, that's the existential quantifier. It means there is some x that. So you have to kind of translate that back into. Uh, the notation that we're used to. But if you look at the, if you t read it with a handout sheet in mind, um, I think, you know, the handout sheet that I uh, gave you about uh, Russell's theory of descriptions, I think you'll be able to figure it out. Now, Frege uses no symbolism in his article, and he wrote in very clear German, so I think it should be intelligible, but it's not easy. Uh, it's a, a tough material. And he has, uh, some, uh, he has some difficult ideas. So let me, at the uh, beginning at least of this lecture, go over what I think are some of the basic points that I want you to understand in both Frege and Russell. Is that OK? I, uh, if, you, if you know all this stuff completely, you can go to sleep for the next few minutes, because I'm going to tell you stuff you already know. All right, the basic idea in Frege, the one I want you to become completely comfortable with, is the distinction between sense and reference. Now, we don't know how to translate that uh, because the German, Sinn und Bedeutung, would normally translate as sense and meaning. You, you all remember the old German poem, Ich weiß nicht, was soll es bedeuten, dass ich so traurig bin. Well, that doesn't mean, uh, the bedeuten there doesn't mean refer to. <laughs> it means uh, meaning. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Uh, that I'm so sad is what the, if you don't know German, forget about it. But it, it's the, uh, the, the poem means, uh, I don't know what it means that I'm so sad. Yeah, what it should mean that I'm so sad. Das ich so traurig bin. And that's the ordinary German. It just means, uh, bedeutend means meaning. But clearly, Frege meant something uh, somewhat different because he does say in one passage, that he's going to say these expressions, bedeuten or benennen or bezeichnen, that they name or refer to or designate. Uh, on the other hand, I kind of like the idea uh, that much of contemporary philosophy is based on a mistranslation of Frege. But in any case, we're going to treat it as reference. And clearly, the analogy of the uh, morning star and the evening star, now the one that he makes more fuss about is an example example from geometry, but he was a mathematician after all. But the one that's stuck in the history of the subject is the evening star, morning star example. And there it's pretty clear. He says, he begins the article by saying, identity is puzzling. Is it a relation? What's it a relation between? And it seems as if an identity statement like the evening star is the morning star. The evening star is identical with a morning star can't say anything other than the evening star is identical with itself. Uh, because uh, if, if it's really true that the evening star is uh, the morning star, then they're one and the same object. And you're saying about that object that it's it, that it's self-identical. So it would look like it, the evening star is the morning star. Couldn't say anything more than the evening star is the evening star. 
I, and if that's the case, how can we get new, uh, new information? But we often do get new information from these identity statements. It was an important discovery uh, that the evening star and the morning star were one and the same star. It, it wasn't something you could figure out just by examining the meanings of the words. So, says Frege, I, I think entirely correctly, we need to distinguish between the uh, expression and the reference of the expression. We need also to introduce the notion of the sense, or as I would say in ordinary English, uh, the ordinary meaning of the expression, the sense that attaches to the words. And that's what enables the expression to pick out an object. Now, there's several important ideas here, but the most important uh, is that attaching uh, to any definite description is a meaning or sense that enables it to pick out the object it refers to. Sense determines reference. Now, you have to be careful. Don't say the sense refers to the object. No. The expression refers to the object in virtue of its sense. So you get a tripartite distinction between the expression, the sense of the expression, and the object referred to by the expression, between the, uh, the sign, the sense, and the reference. OK, so far, so good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the translators are embarrassed. And the first translations was, I, I think, was sense and nominatum, because nominatum isn't an ordinary English word. So they don't feel quite so bad at, uh, using that, because the ordinary English for bedeutung would be meaning. Uh, so they use a, a technical sounding word. Uh, and some translators uh, then, uh, uh, the, the most famous translation was by Geech and Black in 1950. And there they used sense and reference. And then Geech got embarrassed by that uh, and changed it, uh, changed away from reference. And one of his closest friends got absolutely furious and wouldn't speak to him for a long time. That was Michael Dummett. He got furious with Geech about for changing the translation. You'd be surprised how excited philosophers get about what looks like rather obscure points of uh, linguistic usage. Uh, um, but in any case, well, the reason that they, that they got nervous about this was that a German philosopher, a very good philosopher, named Ernst Tugendhat, uh, published a famous article uh, uh, about the translation of this, in which, in effect, he said, uh, all you guys have been mistranslating Frege uh, f for the past uh, 75 or 100 years. Uh, and you ought to try to get the translation right, because it's not the translation of Bedeutung is not reference. OK, but anyway, whatever we call it, nominatum, uh, meaning, reference, designation, there are various words for it. There's an object on the other end of the expression. And the relationship between the expression and the object is mediated by the sense, or I would put it by saying sometimes the descriptive content that's associated with the expression. Now, so far, so good. And I think Frege is exactly right about that. But then they, there's a question, well, what about proper names? Proper names don't normally, uh, aren't, we don't normally think of them as having a meaning. They just stand for somebody. The name just stands for the object. Name, it stands for the guy, or it stands for the place, or whatever else you're naming with the proper name. Now, Frege says, the proper name couldn't refer. It couldn't pick out. It couldn't designate. It couldn't be have a nominatum if it didn't have some kind of a sense. So there must be some description that you associate with the proper name. And then he I, I, has a puzzle. How come then that people can communicate if they associate different descriptions with the same proper name? So with the name Socrates, uh, I think, well, that's the guy uh, who lived in Athens and had all those hassles with the local authorities, and they eventually made him drink uh, hemlock because he was teaching philosophy to young people, always a dangerous profession. Um, and, uh, somebody else might think, no, no, Socrates, he's the guy who invented this ar method of argument in philosophy, the so-called Socratic or dialectic method. 
Uh, now, uh, suppose those we associate those two different descriptions with a name. Says Frege, well, strictly speaking, if you associate a different sense, uh, different descriptive content, then you're not speaking the same language. It's a, you really are speaking a different language when you use the word. But that seems that has to be wrong because we don't think of the proper name as uh, part of a language at all. Uh, you don't learn French uh, by learning uh, the words uh, uh, Marseille, uh, Paris, uh, Lyon, uh, and Strasbourg. Uh, you just, uh, you're not off and running with the knowledge of the French language with those four proper names. Uh, okay, but anyway, Frege seems to have an important idea that there has to be some descriptive content associated with a name in order that it can refer to the object. Uh, but then it seems to me he said something that's wrong. And uh, just to go through this example again, in the sentence, Socrates is bald, you need to distinguish, and I think he's right about this, you need to distinguish the way this expression works, where you have his bald gap, and, and the way this expression works, Socrates. This expression picks out this guy. And I will draw my usual incompetent picture of Socrates. But what does this one do? I think this one doesn't refer to anything. There's nothing that stands to this one in a way that the proper name stands to the object. But Frege didn't think that. He thought, no, there has to be something over here. There has to be a concept, but the concept is incomplete. It has to be something that when joined with the object will form a new unity. Furthermore, the whole sentence, the entire zots, uh, has a, uh, a sense and a reference uh, the reference of the whole zatz is the truth value, either the circumstance that it's true or the circumstance that it's false. And the sense is a proposition uh, for which his word is gadanka, which literally means thought. And I guess he didn't want to use the word proposition because it's used by philosophers in so many different ways. But it seems to be clear that by gadanka, thought, frega means what I've been meaning by proposition. So you get an elegant picture. It just happens the right-hand side, I think, is mistaken. Uh, the proper name, the eigenomen, has a sense, and in virtue of that sense has a reference. The predicate expression also has a sense, and in virtue of that sense has a reference, but the reference is a concept. This, the, whole ne the whole sentence also has a sense. The sense is a proposition, and the reference is a truth value, the circumstance that the sentence is true or the circumstance that it's false. So you have a tripartite distinction that goes across the board between sign, sense, and reference. Okay, now why did Frege extend this stuff over here? Why did he extend the distinction to uh, the uh, predicate half of the sentence and to the whole sentence? Why does he think that just as Socrates, the guy, <laughs> is referred to by the name Socrates, so a concept is referred to by the expression X is bald, and a truth value is referred to by the entire sentence. And his argument, if you I looked at it again this morning, it's not entirely clear, but I think the guts of the argument is that he took Leibniz's law very seriously. Substitutability functions crucially for Frege, and what he thought was, look, substitute something on the right-hand side I, that expresses the same concept as he is bald, and then you get the same truth value. So instead of saying Socrates is bald, you say Socrates lacks hair on the top of his head. I guess that's the meaning of baldness. Um, and then it looks like if you got the same, if you have the same concept, then you also have the same truth value. And you remember, substitutability is supposed to be uh, a, uh, a, a, Leibniz's law tells us that where you have two expressions with the same reference, then they can always be substituted for each other without loss or, or change of the truth value of the original. But then if that's the case, then it seems a natural step to go. Well, when you've got two expressions that can be substituted for each other, 
then it looks like they must have the same reference. But if they've got the same reference, they must have a reference. And in this case, what's common is the concept. So it looks like it's the concept which is referred to. Similarly, if you, in, in, uh, I, I, if you substitute this sentence for some other sentence with the same truth value in a, in a connective like uh, Socrates is bald and, and Plato's fat, or Socrates is bald and Aristotle's sober, uh, if you substitute something with the same truth value, then it looks like you keep the truth value of the original uh, compound sentence. Therefore, it seems like it must have a reference, and the reference must be a truth value. West Regis says, whenever it is uh, the truth, whenever it's the reference we're concerned with, it's the truth value that we're concerned with, and it seemed natural for him to say that the reference of a whole sentence was the truth value. Okay, I haven't told you my theory of the proposition. We're going to get there, but I've got to take you through all these great thinkers, and they are pretty smart, so we've got to take them seriously. It's generally the case with great philosophers that if they say something that sounds crazy, it's never dumb. You have to go over and think, well, why did they say that? What led them to say that? And that applies to Kant especially, who says some things that certainly look dumb on the face, but in fact, if you work at them, uh, there's usually a deep thought behind it. Okay, so you get this tripartite picture. Now, just since the purpose of this part of the lecture is just to review the stuff that I think is important, the important thing is the distinction between sense and reference as it applies here. I think the other stuff is false for reasons I'm going to tell you. That the, there's not what stands to the predicate as the guy stands to the proper name. The answer is nothing. There's nothing that the predicate refers to. And the whole sentence doesn't refer either. You know that already because, you know, the whole sentence is used to perform a speech act. It's used to perform an entire illocutionary act. And referring isn't something you do on its own, the way you can perform the act of asserting on its own. Reference always occurs as part of an illocutionary act. Okay. But so I think this part is true, uh, this stuff over here. And the other stuff is wrong, though interesting, and we ought to be able to say exactly why it's wrong. But now Frege had a very important insight, and that was it is a mistake, as traditional logicians thought, it's a mistake to think that Socrates is bald, uh, some men are bald, all men are bald, many men are bald, that all of those have the same logical form. That just as Socrates, the word refers to the guy Socrates, so some men are bald. <laughs> In that statement, the expression some men refers to some men. No, it doesn't refer to men at all. The way that the quantifier expressions work is quite different from the way proper names work. How do they work? Well, says Frege, you have to think of the quantifiers, all, some, as expressions that express concepts that apply to other concepts. So if you have this, if you have the sentence, Socrates is bald, knock out the proper name, and you have not a sentence, but just a couple of words, but stick in this blank to make it clear that you're, they're supposed to be grammatically related, and that still looks ugly. So we put in an X, but it's important to see X is bald is not a sentence. It's called an open sentence or a sentential function, it's sometimes called. Okay, but now you can complete that with another expression that's not a sentence, and that is this expression. There is some x such that, and now you've completed the open sentence. The open sentence contains a free variable. The x in x is bold is called a free variable. But now when you connect, complete the thing, that, that open sentence with the other open sentence, there is some x such that, blah, blah, blah. Then you complete that with the other open sentence, you get a complete sentence. There is some x such that x is bald. That says something is bald. And you are completing the open sentence by binding the variable. You've now bound the variable. The free variable x is, in x is bald is no longer free. You can't use it to stand for anybody. You can't stick in anybody's name there because now you have a complete sentence, the sentence x is bald. Now, Frege's great insight to, was to see 
that the way that the quantifier expressions function, some x is bald, all x is bald, uh, many x is bald, no x is bald, the way that those function is quite different from proper names. They do not refer to objects. Rather, their, and, and I think the, his description is a good way to describe it, their concepts of a second level, uh, they apply to first level concepts to say whether or not those concepts have instances. So there is some x that, such that x is bald. Some men are bald doesn't refer to some men and say uh, that those specific men are uh, bald. And you can see that with negation because if some men is, if you say uh, it's not the case that some men are bald, then you're not saying uh, about uh, some men that they are not bald. You're saying rather that the uh, concept is bald doesn't apply to anybody if no, because that's equivalent to nobody is bald. Whereas if you negate Socrates is bald, it's not the case that Socrates is bald, you're still talking about Socrates. So it's important to see that the quantifier expressions don't function like ordinary referring expressions, and that was an essential feature of Frege's development of logic. Uh, and, and, and then the next step for Frege was to see, and numerical expressions are also express second level concepts. Uh, uh, so there are three horses in the field, says the concept horse in the field has three instances. It's thrice instantiated. Uh, so uh, number expressions and quantifier expressions don't refer to physical objects. Uh, they're, they're not like uh, it isn't that each horse in the field has the property of threeness. Rather, it is the concept horse in the field that applies to three object that applies to three objects, or is three times or thrice instantiated. Okay, so there are two important ideas I want you to take away from Frege. One is the distinction between sense and reference as it applies to singular terms, and one is uh, uh, the idea that the quantifier expressions express second level concepts. They're concepts that apply to concepts. Now that's very important in the history of philosophy because of course exists is a second level concept and that we can now see what's wrong with the ontological proof for the existence of God. What definitions tell you is the properties an object must have if it exists. So if I tell you that a triangle is a three-sided plane figure, that's a definition. What that tells you, if anything is a triangle, then it has the properties of being a three-sided plane figure. But existence is not in that way a property. It's not a property of objects. So you can't define anything into existence. You can't prove that God exists by definition, because what the definition of God tells you is the properties that God must have if he does exist. And consequently, with Frege, we at last, uh, we at long last get to see exactly what's wrong with the ontological proof for the existence of God. It tries to prove God exists by definition, uh, but you can't prove that kind of thing by definition because what a definition tells you are the properties an entity must have if it's to satisfy the definition, whereas uh, existence is not a property, and consequently you can't simply define anything into existence. So there are three, that, three ways of saying the same thing. One is to say existence is not a property of objects. Another thing is to say the subject expressions in existential statements, statements like horses exist, dragons do not exist, those subject expressions, horses and dragons, don't refer to objects, because if you took them as referring to objects, then you'd have to assume the existence of the object in order to say that it doesn't exist, or in order to say that it does exist. If the statement were in the affirmative, it would presuppose its own truth. If it were in the negative, it would presuppose its own falsehood. Okay, so what is the right thing to say about existential <laughs> statements? In the existential statement of the form horses exist, it's not like horses eat hay. Uh, what it says is the concept horse has instances. There are, and that's why incidentally in English and other languages, there are usually two ways of uh, asserting existence. 
On the one hand, language strives for a kind of symmetry. It exists, conjugates like any other verb. But on the other hand, English and other languages recognize that there's something fishy about treating existence as an ordinary property. So in English, we say, there are such things as, or there is such a thing as, there is or there are. And that goes across languages. In French, it's il y a. And in German, it's it gives. I like that. It, it gives horses. Es gibt. And in Spanish, it's I, I caballos. Uh, and I, I don't know a Spanish morphology, but there's got to be some a bear kicking out of that, right? I mean, there's some uh, uh, to have screaming out of I. I and you can uh, check it out, but my bet is, uh, I'll bet you a Spanish reale uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the origin of I has to be a bear. And it'd be interesting to know for other languages, uh, does Russian have two ways of expressing existence? What's going on? What's going on is the sentence, Horses exist looks like Socrates is bald, but it's not like that at all. The subject expression doesn't refer to horses in a way that the subject expression refers to Socrates in Socrates is bald. So what does go on? What does go on is that in the existence statement, the subject expression expresses a concept, horse, in this case horses exist, and the predicate expression tells you whether or not that concept has instances, as in the case of horses exist, or doesn't have instances, as in the case of dragons, do not exist. OK, so three things to say about existential statements. One, existence is not a property of objects. Two, subject expressions in existential statements don't refer. And three, which Frege discovered, existence is a second level concept. It's a concept that applies to concepts. Uh, OK, now I gave you a machine gun summary of the entire philosophy of language of Gottlob Frege, and it probably came out as even more obscure uh, than the original uh, uh, lectures. But maybe if, if you uh, read the, the uh, assigned reading and go over that handout sheet, it will become clearer. Now we're going to go through Russell, and we're going to do a similar machine gun treatment of Russell. What the important ideas I want you to get out of Frege are the distinction between sense and reference as it applies to singular terms, uh, definite descriptions, proper names. We haven't got to indexical expressions like this and that, but we'll get to those. And I also want you to get the idea which was crucial for his reinvention of logic, and that's the idea between first level and second level concepts. OK, now we're going to go to Russell. Questions about what I said about Frege. Is this thing working, by the way? Can you, OK, it does work. You can hear me. Terrific. All right, so questions about um, uh, what I just said or any, anything about Frege. The handout sheet. I don't know. These handout sheets are helpful. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's useful to me uh, to sort, down, sort out some of the things I want to tell you. Uh, the difficulty with Frege is I could have kept going. That is, there are a whole lot more things in Frege. And I thought, well, let's just stop at, at uh, 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 10. And now there's another important idea in Frege that I'm going to uh, try to refute later on. And that is the idea that in these contexts, like Sally believes that or Sam said that, words lose their ordinary sense and reference. And the sense, the, the reference of the word in Sally believes that it's raining is the sense of the words, the proposition that it's raining. And again, his reason for saying that is if you substitute another uh, proposition uh, uh, that's the same, uh, that has a different expression but the same meaning as the first one, it's raining, then the substitution works. So if I, believe, if I say Sally believes that it's raining, and then I substitute something synonymous with it's raining, drops of water naturally formed in clouds are falling out of the sky, I guess that's a synonym for it's raining, then if Sally believes that it's raining, she does believe that. So it looks to Frege as if, well, if you can substitute the proposition, then the proposition must be what's referred to. So in these indirect, ungerade uh, contexts, the reference is the customary sense. And the sense is the sense of the words, the proposition that, uh, and then follows uh, the proposition uh, that you are repeating or that you are expressing when you say, Sally believes that it's raining. What you're really saying is, Sally believes the proposition that it's raining. 
and, and uh, there what's referred to is a proposition uh, and not a, a, a truth value. Okay, now should we go on to Russell? Everybody's with us. You've got Frege under your belts, and you can reread the, uh, the, uh, the passages. Yeah. Concepts, begriff. And I, I, I always get German adjectives st uh, stuck. But it's the begriff der zweiter Stufe. It's the upstairs concept. Yeah. Well, Russell thought that Russell had a theory of logical types. And Russell tried to avoid Russell's paradox uh, by saying you're, you can't mix uh, uh, types that way. You cannot say uh, of, the, of a horse. Uh, you can't say of the... Uh, uh, the class of horses, either that it is or that it's not a horse, because is a horse can only apply, or is a horse or is not a horse can only apply to ground level objects, like uh, this piece of chalk is not a horse, uh, but the horse in the barn is a horse. But Russell thought in his theory of types, you can't talk, you can't do the self-reference where you say that the concept horse is a horse or is not a horse, because if you say that, then you're going to get into Russell's paradox. You're going to get into the paradox of the, uh, the a class of all classes that are not members of themselves. Is it a member of itself? Well, if it is, it isn't. And if it isn't, it is. I mean, so he, Russell had a, a different objective in mind, but he did accept a distinction between different levels. And the distinction for him, it was called the theory of types in Russell. And the theory of logical types was designed to avoid Russell's paradox, was designed to avoid the paradox of the class of all classes or the set of all that sets that are not members of themselves. Okay, other questions before we go on to Russell. So the main, two main ideas, well, let's say three main ideas I want you to get out of Frege. The two that are true are the distinction between sense and reference as applied to singular noun phrases and uh, the idea uh, that um, uh, there are second level concepts like exists, the quantifiers, numerical expression, uh, 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 numbers, uh, 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 numerical expressions all express second level concepts. And third, uh, that when you have these indirect contexts like Sally believes that or Sam said that, uh, that in all those cases words lack their ordinary sense and reference. Their reference is their ordinary sense. Okay, with, with the, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Inten the concepts that, the context that Frege talks about when he says Sally believes that and then follows something, uh, it is raining. This context is an intentional with an S context. Why is it intentional with an S? Because it fails the tests for extensionality. Um, and maybe I, say, I didn't put in a referring expression, so let's put in a referring expression. Uh, let's uh, put in uh, Mark Twain is an author. Now, Sally might not know that Mark Twain is identical with Samuel Clemens, so you can't make the substitution. Sally believes that Samuel Clemens is an author uh, because Sally might uh, know about Mark Twain, but she might think Samuel Clemens is a, a, a name of a, a stockbroker in San Francisco and not the name of an author. Okay, so that sentence, Sally believes that Mark Twain is an author, is said to be intentional with respect to substitutability. Remember, substitutability is Leibniz's law. And it says whenever two expressions refer to the same object, you can substitute one for the other without changing the truth value of the original. But here, you can't make the substitution because there's no guarantee that from the fact that Sally believes that Mark Twain is an author, that she believes that Samuel Clemens is an author, even though Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens is identical. That sentence, uh, as you know, is said to be intentional with an S because it fails 
a test for extensionality. It fails the test of substitutability. Uh, and, but now, why is it intentional with an S? Well, I just told you. But the failure of that test derives from the fact that the sentence itself reports a state which is intentional with a T. What then is the relationship between intentionality with a T and intentionality with an S? Now, a lot of philosophers think, well, they really must be the same. Intentionality with an S, intentionality with a T, it's the same thing. That is a very deep mistake. Intentionality with a T is that property of the mind by which it is directed at objects and states of affairs in the world. Uh, this belief of Sally is directed at objects and states of affairs in the world. Intentionality with an S is a property of sentences by which they fail certain tests for extensionality. So intentionality with an S is opposed to extensionality with an S. The connection is this. Typically, a report of an intentional with a T state will be a report of a, not of how things are in the world, but of how somebody represents how they are in the world. It will be not of a report of what's actually happening in the world of Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens, but what is happening inside Sally's head. So the sentence, Sally believes that Mark Twain is an author, is a representation of a mental representation. It's a representation of a representation. And consequently, its truth depends on, not on how things are in the real world, but how they are in Sally's head. And in Sally's head, it might not be the case that when she thinks Mark Twain, she's also prepared to think Samuel Clements. That's why I gave you the example of uh, the sheriff and Jesse James. Presumably, the sheriff does believe that Mr. Mr. Howard is an honest man, but he doesn't believe that Jesse James is an honest man, even though unknown to him, Jesse James and Mr. Ne Jesse James, the notorious outlaw, is identical with Mr. Howard, uh, the guy who lives in the house with a white picket fence down the street. Okay, now is that, is that, does that uh, take care of the problem that was puzzling you? Yeah. Did you have a question? No. Okay, so let me, I, 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 until recently, really I think until uh, the publication of uh, the book Intentionality, it was standard in the philosophical literature to confuse intentionality with a T and intentionality with an S. And there were any number of bad books with titles like The Intentions of Intentionality. <laughs> Uh, where they would use S and T interchangeably. They are radically different. Intentionality with a T is a property of the mind and consequently a property of language because, of course, uh, sentences and uh, propositions are also intentional with a T since they are directed at about objects and states of affairs in the world. But intentionality with an S is a logical property by which certain representations fail tests for extensionality. And as I told you before, and I'll repeat now, the two most famous tests are substitutability of identicals and existential generalization. Can you infer the existence of the object that the statement is apparently about from the truth of the statement? So the statement, John is looking for the lost city of Atlantis, fails the test of existential generalization because you can't infer that there exists a place, there exists a lost city such that John is looking for it. Whereas John lives in Kansas City is extensional with respect to the existence, gener to existence generalization, existential generalization because you can infer that uh, there exists uh, a city such that John lives in it. If it's true that John lives in Kansas City, then there must exist an X such that X, uh, such that John lives in X. The, uh, the existence inference follows from that statement. That statement is said to be extensional with respect to existential generalization. There are other tests of extensionality. Uh, one test is the extensionality of connectives. So and is an extensional connective 
because if you have any two propositions on either side uh, of P and Q, and one that has the same truth value as another, then you can substitute. 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, and 3 plus 5 equals 8. You can substitute uh, a, a 2 is a prime number for either of those and plug it in. 2 is a prime number, and 3 plus 5 equals 8 is OK. But other connectives, such as because, are not extensional because you can't make the substitution. If I say Obama won the election because uh, the economy was in bad shape, uh, I can't substitute Obama won the election because 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, they both have the same truth value, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and the economies in bad shape are both true. But you can't make the substitution with the connective because this connective is said to be intentional with an S. It's an intentional connective. It creates contexts which are intentional with an S. So you get different criteria for extensionality. The substitutability of whole sentences is one criterion where you have sentential connectives. And then you have a similar criteria for uh, predicate expressions. Uh, has a heart and has a kidney uh, uh, are true of the same objects, but there are concepts in which you can't substitute one for uh, the other, and that's, uh, and those contexts are such that the um, uh, the occurrence of the predicate is said to be an intentional with an S occurrence with respect to that test. So you get other kinds of tests. Remember, I give you the example of necessarily uh, eight is greater than seven. Uh, the number of planets equals 8. It doesn't follow that necessarily the number of planets is greater than 7. So that context, it is necessary that, is also said to be intentional with an S. Okay, shall we, shall we go on and, and, and uh, I, I go through uh, uh, Russell? Now, the essential, the, the, the essential ideas I want you to get about Frege, I've just summarized. The essential idea that I want you to get from uh, Russell there's a, there's a single idea that he emphasizes over and over, and that is grammatical form is misleading as to logical form. Uh, the sentence, uh, the President of the United States lives in Washington, looks like it's a subject predicate sentence. It's just like Barack Obama lives in Washington. But, says Russell, that's misleading. And you can see that it's misleading if you consider cases where the subject expression fails to refer, such as I, the king of France is bald. In the case of Bar uh, the president of the United States lives in Washington, the subject expression does actually refer or apparently refers to an actual guy. But in the case of the King of France is bald, there is no such guy as the King of France. Therefore, what shall we say about the sentence? Is it false that the King of France is bald, or is it neither true nor false? Frege says it's neither true nor false because, uh, he says, if there's nothing referred to by the subject expression, then there's nothing there for it to be a true or false of that he is bald. It's not, uh, certainly not true that he's bald, but it can't be false either because there's no guy there uh, for it to be true or false of. Now, Russell thought that was the wrong way to an analyze it. He thought the right way to analyze it was to see it as a disguised existential statement. And the proper analysis of the King of France is bald is that there is some x such that X is the king of France. And now came a beautiful gimmick, a beautiful technical device that Russell invented. How do we get that there's only one of these guys? And Russell does it this way. And for each thing Y, Y is the king of France only if Y is identical with X. Now what's this doing here? What's this part doing? Well, this part says there exists at least one king of France. And this part says there exists at most one king of France because for anything you care to name, if that thing is a king of France, 
then it's got to be identical with the guy over here that you uh, specified when you gave uh, this occurrence of the quantifier. And then the rest of the sentence is that x is bald. Um, we need another. I'm no good with uh, brackets, but there is some x such as kx, and for each thing y, ky implies y, and bx. Okay. Um, yeah, no, you don't need another bracket because we've already got that one. This is, the this is a separate <coughs> existential quantifier inside the scope, a, a, a separate universal quantifier inside the scope of the existential quantifier. Okay, now let me go through this because I want you to understand it intuitively. Russell says, let's put it in ordinary English. What's it say? It says, there exists at least one king of France. <laughs> there exists at most one king of France. And whatever is king of France is bald. Or if anything is a king of France, it's bald. Now, how does that say those things? Well, the first part, there is an X such that KX says, there is at least one king of France. The second part, and furthermore, I anything that's king of France has to be identical with that uh, X. That says there's at most one king of France. And this last part says, oh yeah, and by the way, uh, that X that satisfies all those other conditions is bald. Now, it's important to get this exactly right. The beauty of the uh, predicate calculus is it eliminates ambiguities. Sometimes you'll read authors who say, what Russell claimed was that the statement the king of France is bald really says, uh, there is one and only one thing which is king of France and is bald. That's not the, it. That's a muddle. That would allow for there being a whole lot of kings of France all of whom except one I have a lot of hair. Does everybody see that? It's, Russell is not saying there's only one and one thing which is king of France and is bald. That's not it. Rather, there's one and only one thing which is king of France and that thing is bald. Uh, that doesn't allow for a whole lots of other kings of France. There's one and only one thing which is the king of France. Okay, now why was this so important? It was important because it gave us what looked like a scientific, rigorous, mathematical statement which eliminated the ambiguities of ordinary language and which would enable us to see why uh, this puzzling character, this uh, a puzzle about the truth value could be swiftly uh, taken care of. You just see, this is a straightforward existence claim and it's false because it says falsely that there exists an object which is uh, a, a king of France, which is uniquely king of France, and there is no such object. There's no object that satisfies the condition of being the king of France. Uh, okay, furthermore, says Russell, he can solve a bunch of other puzzles with this. He can solve the problem about negative existentials. What are they about? If I say the Golden Mountain doesn't exist, am I saying about this thing, the Golden Mountain, that it doesn't exist? No, says uh, Russell, it just comes out as it's not the case uh, that there is an X such that X is uniquely the golden mountain. Uh, and uh, then what about identity statements? Well, in the case of Scott as the author of Waverly, uh, you, have to sh uh, you have to see that whereas Scott actually picks out an object, the author of Waverly, that doesn't refer at all. That part there just comes out as an existential claim. So the whole thing gets analyzed as there is some X. I, I, this is all on a handout sheet, so I won't write it on the blackboard again. Uh, there is some X such that X wrote Waverly, and for each thing Y, Y wrote Waverly only if Y is identical with X, and uh, X is identical with Scott. So it looks like you can use this analysis not just to solve the problem about uh, identity, not, not just to solve the problem about a, a reference failure, as in uh, the uh, king of France is bald, but also to solve other, solve other problems, such as the problem of negative existentials, the problem that bothered Frege in the first place, the problem about identity statements, and then finally, the problem about uh, these opaque uh, or intentional with an S context. And there, Russell makes a, an important distinction between the primary and the secondary occurrence. And later on, that gets picked up as the distinction between the de re and the de dicto occurrence. So you need a distinction between 
there is this guy who wrote Waverly, and about that guy, George IV wanted to know, was he identical with Scott? That's the primary occurrence, because that commits the speaker to the existence of the author of Waverly. The secondary occurrence has all of that inside the scope of the in intentional verb wondered whether, and there it comes out as George the Fourth wanted to know whether there is some X such that X wrote Waverly uniquely, uh, and X is Scott. And there, that doesn't commit you to the existence of the author of Waverly. Uh, there it has a secondary occurrence. And on the handout sheet, that's uh, under number four are those two uh, occurrences. The primary occurrences, which says, there is an object that wrote Waverly uniquely. And by the way, George IV wanted to know whether or not that object is identical with Scott, whereas the secondary occurrence uh, has it all inside the scope of the intentional verb. George IV wanted to know whether. And then comes the whole thing. There is some X such that X wrote Waverly uniquely, and X is Scott. Uh, OK, so it looks like, and Russell, uh, uh, this was, well, when Russell first published this, I think a lot of people scratched their heads and wondered what the hell is going on here. Later on, they began to see its importance, and now I think it's generally recognized as one of the most important uh, arguments of the 20th century. Now, uh, Strawson thinks he refuted it, and I'm going to tell you that refutation. I, I started on that last time, but I'm going to go over it uh, uh, again so you'll understand it. OK, so I want you to see now the difference between Frege and Russell. Frege looked at an expression like, uh, the Queen of England lives in London. I looked at a sentence like that and asked, how does it work? The expression, the Queen of England, refers to a woman in virtue of the fact that it has a sense, and the woman satisfies the sense. You remember, the sense gives you the mode of presentation. In my jargon, it would come out, it gives you the condition that an object has to satisfy. It gives you a condition of satisfaction, the condition an object has to satisfy in order to be referred to. Now, Russell's answer is quite radical. Russell says in the sentence, the Queen of England lives in London, the subject expression doesn't refer at all. Yeah, there's no answer to the question, well, how does it refer to this woman? It doesn't. What it does is assert the existence of a woman. It asserts the existence uniquely. And the whole sentence then comes out as, there is some X such that X is a Queen of England. And for each thing, why, why is a Queen of England only if X is identical with Y? And X lives in, where did I have her living in London? Uh, the Queen of England lives in London. I, I, and so it comes out like the King of France is bald. But Singular reference for definite descriptions is eliminated uh, on Russell's account. It's a disguise. It looks, from a grammatical point of view, as if the subject expression refers, but it doesn't really refer because gram grammar is misleading as to logic. The grammatical form is misleading as to the logical form. The grammatical form looks like it's subject predicate, but it's not really subject predicate. It's really a disguised existential statement, where an existential statement is one that asserts or denies the existence of something. OK, does everybody understand that? Yeah. yeah with something like the Golden Mountain doesn't exist, it's different from like horses doesn't exist. Yes. You have this concept word and subject to So what would Frege have said about OK, let's go through that. In the case of the Golden Mountain does not exist. Now, Frege has an interesting a claim. He says, strictly speaking, if you have a real proper name like Socrates, it doesn't make sense to put that in an existential statement. It doesn't make sense to say either Socrates exists or Socrates does not exist because Socrates is not a concept expression. It refers to a ground level or zero level object. So how about the Golden Mountain does not exist? Frege would have to interpret that as saying not. It refers to the Golden Mountain and says of it that it doesn't exist. That would be absurd. But you have to take the Golden Mountain there as being used to express a concept. You'd have to take it 
not as an ordinary eigennamen, because Frege thought that an eigennamen can't function in an existential statement. It makes no sense for Frege to say that I, I, Barack Obama exists or Barack Obama doesn't exist uh, because an ex existence is a second level concept and you have to predicate it of a first level concept. There has to be a ground floor concept. So he would grant you that in an ordinary, uh, in ordinary English, the expression like the golden mountain does not exist is okay, but that's because the golden mountain there is not functioning as a proper name. It's not a genuine eigennamen, and there I think he'd have to accept uh, the Russellian style analysis. Uh, uh, what he would say is, well, what that does is express the concept of golden mountain and say that it has no instances in the same way that dragons do not exist, express the concept of dragon and says that it has no instances. So on this particular one, it looks like uh, Russell seems closer to our ordinary intuitions than Frege, because Frege is forced to say, you can't say of uh, uh, using a proper name, uh, you can't use it in an existent statement. It's not meaningful. Yeah, say some more. Yeah. And it still functions as a proper name, but it just lacks its Greek origin. It just doesn't have a reference. Well, that might be, but the problem with that is how do you interpret? You'd have to interpret. Uh, there is some X such that X is Socrates. Yeah, if you're saying that it doesn't exist, you'd have to say. Uh, you'd have to say it lacks a truth value if it's if it's. If it's true, it lacks a truth value, and that's uh, very uncomfortable to say that uh, for anybody. But what he actually said about uh, proper names is that it doesn't make sense to uh, just flatly assert or deny uh, Jones exists or Jones does not exist. Uh, okay, any other questions? All of those are, are very helpful. Well, let's go on to Strawson then. Strawson says you need to distinguish in a way that Russell failed to distinguish between the, what you can say about the sign or the sentence, what you can say about the utterance of a sentence, and what you can say about the use of a sentence to make a statement. Now, Russell thought, according to Strawson, that a sentence was either true or false or meaningless. Now, strictly speaking, that's not quite fair uh, to Russell because Russell says not that the sentence is true, false, or meaningless, but rather that the sentence, if it expresses a proposition, if, if it's meaningful, it expresses a proposition, and the proposition is either true or false. So Russell, it's a little unfair of Strawson to say Russell thought that trichotomy applied to sentences, true, false, or meaningless. <coughs> Rather, what Russell, in fact, thought was that, that if the sentence is meaningful, it expresses a proposition. And if it expresses a proposition, the proposition must be either true or false. But anyway, I, with that, I mean, with that uh, footnote, we can then uh, uh, spell out Strawson's objection. What Strawson is saying is that the sentence, the King of France is bald, certainly is meaningful. It's a perfectly ordinary, meaningful English sentence. But if it's meaningful, according to Russell, it must express a proposition that's true or false. Strawson says, no, it's meaningful, but rather what will be true or false is not the sentence, but rather the use of the sentence to make a statement and here's where he thinks he parts company, essentially, from Russell. The sentence, though perfectly meaningful, cannot be used to make a statement which is either true or false. Why not? Because the statement presupposes the existence of an object, and if the object doesn't exist, then the statement is defective. Then there's something wrong with a statement. It lacks a truth value says Strawson, the question of truth or falsity does not even arise. It can't arise if there is no such object because to say of something that it's bald or not bald presupposes the existence of the object. 
about which you are making that statement. And indeed, some people who agree with Strawson on this says Russell, in effect, commits the fallacy of many questions. It's like the guy who says, have you stopped beating your wife, yes or no? Uh, well, if you say, uh, uh, yes, I've stopped beating her, well, then it looks like I used to beat her. If you say, no, it looks like, well, you're still continuing to beat her. But of course, uh, that's the, there are many questions contained in the question, have you stopped beating <laughs> your wife? Uh, and one of them is, uh, did you beat her in the first place? And now uh, the argument goes, uh, it, it, you can't say, true or false, the king of France is bald. That's like, true or false, you've stopped beating your wife. Uh, true or false, the king of France is bald. Well, it looks like there can't be an answer to that question, because if you say, well, it's false that the king of France is bald, then you're saying, well, there, you seem to be saying, well, there's this guy with a lot of hair, and he's the king of France. So that won't do. So, says uh, Strawson, we need to distinguish presupposition failure from falsity. Uh, now, it looked like uh, Strawson had a pretty good distinction going here, but if you try to spell out what exactly is meant by presupposition, then it looks like you have a problem or you have various technical <laughs> problems. Um, uh, let me just hint at some of those because I'll come back to them later. The definition that Strawson gives us, it's not in this article that you read, but it's in a subsequent article. He says, a proposition P presupposes a proposition Q, if and only if, in order for P to be either true or false, Q must be true. Uh, okay, so the proposition that the king of France is bald presupposes the proposition that the king of France exists because in order for it to be true or false that the king of France uh, is bald, the king of France must exist. But if you say that, if you try to define it logically in that way, then you get funny results. The proposition that the king of France is bald is neither true nor false. Okay, write that down on the blackboard. I won't write it because it's uh, uh, simple enough. You can keep it in your mind. It turns out then it is not true. It, it is not true and it is not false that the king of France is bald, right? Everybody got that. But now from that you can infer it's not true that the king of France is bald. And to say, well, it's not true that the king of France is bald, that looks an awful lot like saying uh, it's false that the king of France is bald. So this was a, a little technical difficulty in Strawson's definition of presupposition. Uh, it looks like you're going to be able to do these permutations on it where it comes out that it's not true that the king of France is bald, and it looks like Strawson is committed to that. Uh, it follows from the fact that it's neither true nor false. What I think is right in Strawson, and it seems to me this is crucial, is you need to construe what is going on in the utterance of the sentence as a speech act. The speech act is one of making an assertion, and within the assertion there's a speech act of referring. Referring is not something that words do. It's something that speakers do with words. And the speaker using that word, using the expression the King of France, to, uh, to refer will fail. There is a reference failure, a failure of the, of the speech act, and that seems to me what's right in Strawson is to see that. And, and in fact, I gave you an extra argument for that last time, is that the <coughs> you shouldn't confuse the s speech act of referring with the assertion uh, of an existential proposition. It's you presuppose that the king of France exists when you try to refer to him, but that's like the way you presuppose that somebody exists if you try to hit him. If you try to hit him, that's not a statement that he exists. Uh, and similarly, trying to refer to him is not a statement that there exists such a person uh, to be referred to. I, you shouldn't confuse the performance of an action with the assertion of the conditions necessary for the performance of the action. Speech, uh, referring is a speech act like any other, and like any speech act, it has conditions for its successful performance. And I added an extra argument to Strawson by saying, well, look, if you think of cases 
other than assertions, other than the statement that the King of France is bald, uh, you can see there's something fishy about Russell's analysis. Because if somebody says to me, take this book to the King of France, then it seems funny to say that that person has made a statement that there exists a King of France. He didn't make a statement. He presupposed that. There's no way I can obey the order, take this book to the King of France, because there is no King of France. But that's not because he made a false assertion that the King of France exists. It's rather that in order for me to carry out the order, in order for me to obey the order, the King of France, uh, take this book to the King of France, there would have to be a King of France, and there is no such person. So you can see what's wrong with, what's right about Strawson and what's wrong with Russell if you consider speech acts other than just making a statement. As, as long as you're just talking about making the statement the King of France is bald, then it looks like, well, maybe that really is an assertion. But if you say, take this book to the King of France, and contrast this with take this book to the Queen of England, you can't say the second of those makes a true assertion, and the first one makes a false assertion, because neither makes an assertion. They're not in that line of business. Ordering somebody to take a book to somebody is not the same as asserting the existence of something. Uh, okay, there are lots of uh, other details we're going to get to, but let me locate where we are now in the subject matter of the course. Uh, they, the main uh, aim of this course is to explain how language relates to reality, and I'm, gonna, I'm giving an answer to that question. It relates to reality because people uh, relate it in the performance of speech acts. But now we're going over, uh, historically, what is the, uh, the central zone of combat, the central area of dispute. Uh, in this whole uh, territory. And it's the usual situation in philosophy whereby you seem to oscillate be between the trivial and the apocalyptic, uh, between the, the minute and the gigantic. The gigantic apocalyptic question is how does language relate to reality? Language and thought and experience, how do they hook on to the real world? Uh, and the minutiae are about the, uh, the King of France and the uh, Queen of England. And people who come to philosophy the first time will wonder, what the hell all this fight about the King of France? Who gives a damn about the King of France? I came here because I wanted to learn some big deal philosophical question. Well, the way you solve big deal philosophical questions is by getting the details right down there in the fine minutiae. So we're oscillating, as usual, as we usually do in philosophy, between this vast question about the relation of thought and language to reality, on the one hand, uh, and, well, what are we going to say about the King of France, uh, about the statement the King of France is bold? And I want you to see those are really the same question. You can't answer the, the big deal question without answering the specific questions because it's there where the actual issue is resolved. Now, this debate went on. And in the 1970s, all hell broke loose when a whole bunch of people began to argue, well, the whole assumption behind these discussions uh, is that meanings are all in the head. Uh, and what we're interested in is analyzing how the meanings in the head relate to the real world. But suppose meanings are not in the head. Suppose meanings are kind of natural phenomena in the world. And I'm now, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of arguments to show that. Uh, and this is, uh, 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 so to speak, the prevailing orthodoxy today. I, I think it's utterly mistaken, but I'm going to tell you what it is so you know what it is. Here's how it goes. If you take all of these discussions, uh, they seem to presuppose that in our heads, we have a certain meaning attaching to the word Socrates or a meaning attaching to the expression the king of France. But suppose meanings are not in the heads. Well, here's an argument that meanings are not in the head. It's probably the most famous argument. The guy who invented it told me he no longer believes it, but unfortunately it's a, the philosophical result that he's most famous for. So there you are, he's stuck with it. Here's how it goes. It's called, it's got a name, it's called a twin earth argument. And it's due to a philosopher uh, at, uh, well, he used, to, he used to be at Harvard. He's now retired. His name is Hillary Putnam. And Putnam's argument goes as follows. You think that the word water 
means a clear, a colorless, tasteless liquid. And you think that Socrates uh, means a guy who lived in a, a, a certain place and, and did certain sorts of things. But imagine that in a distant galaxy uh, outside our light cone, uh, there is a planet that's exactly like our Earth. Call it twin Earth. Uh, and on this twin Earth, uh, everything is, as philosophers like to say, molecule for molecule identical with everything that goes on on Earth. So uh, in this, in twin Earth, there's a twin Berkeley that looks exactly like Berkeley. And in twin Berkeley, uh, there is a doppelganger, uh, a double goer, uh, who, who is exactly like you, as they say, molecule for molecule, with one exception. And that is, on Earth, what we call water is, in fact, H2O. But on twin Earth, water, what they call water, has a very long chemical formula. I couldn't even put it on the blackboard. So it just abbreviated as XYZ. So Earth water is H2O. Uh, twin Earth water is XYZ. Now, says uh, uh, Putnam, do they mean the same thing by the word water that we mean? But let's go back to 1750, before anybody knew that water is H2O. Nowadays, in our heads, we have associated with the word water H2O, and we can, have, we can assume they have X, Y, Z. But in 1750, before anybody knew anything about the chemical composition of water, what they had in their head was absolutely identical what people on this earth had in their head associated with the word water. Does everybody see that? Uh, if you ask them to define water on twin earth, they'd give the same definition that we would give. But now here's, and this is the, the punchline, this is the conclusion of Putnam's argument. All the same, though they uh, had in their head exactly the same thing that we have in, uh, we had in our head in 1750, they did not mean the same thing. What they meant on twin earth when they used the word water was quite different from what people on earth meant when they used the word water, even though what's in their heads was absolutely identical, was type identical, because their uh, physical construction was type identical. So what's in the head, says Putnam, is not sufficient for meaning because what's in the head, meaning, is supposed to determine reference. They have the same reference in the head, but they mean something different. It has a different extension. It refers to something different. So the sense must be different. This is a famous argument. It's called a twin earth argument. Uh, and it looks like it will apply across the board. Uh, they, uh, what uh, they mean <coughs> by any term will, be, uh, will have something in their head, which will be the same as we have in our head with that term, but it may well turn out that they mean something different. So, says Putnam, meanings ain't in the head. Why not? Because what's in the head is insufficient to do the job we want meaning to do. We want meaning to explain the relation between language and reality. What's in their head with the word water is the same as what, and what's our head with the word water in 1750, but all the same, they mean X, Y, Z, even if they don't know that. We mean H2O, even when we didn't know that. Meanings are not in the head. Well, what are they then? Well, they're supposed to be what? A kind of causal relation to objects in the world. Now, I, I, this is the beginning of a huge debate that goes on. It is a debate uh, said to be a debate between internalism, the idea that meanings are internal to the head, and externalism, the idea that meanings are external to the head. I, I am an unregenerate internalist. On the other hand, I may be the last of the Mohicans uh, because I discovered that the uh, views that I regard as obviously and screamingly false 
are now routinely uh, printed in the journals and taught to uh, uh, helpless graduate students who don't know any better. Uh, anyway, we'll go on with that next time.